OK, today I'm going to, uh, uh, for this lecture, it's not going to be very much a lecture. It's going to be kind of an exercise that I'm going to go through together. It's going to be using a dynamic modeling program called Stella. And uh, we're going to kind of both together build a model. And I'm going to show you kind of one or two ways you can kind of incorporate climate or weather data into these, uh, into these models. Now, is this, should I turn off one of these lights? Oops, wrong one. On the wall also. I did this one, but this one's only. Bottom. Oh, as far as we can Yeah, do we know how to get this one out? There we go. Is that, what's that? Is that okay for everybody? Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to, first we're going to build a, a very simple kind of SEER model that you've you've seen before, and I'm going to show you how to do it with this program. What's nice about this program, it's, it uses a graphical uh, interface, so it's, it's very easy to use. It's fairly intuitive. Um, it's not too expensive. There's a free version on uh, the web, but it's, it's kind of a, a trial version, so you can run things in it, but you can't save your models. Um, and then there's different licenses for like an academic license, a student's license, and, and et cetera. So it's called Stella, and it's the IC Systems is the name of the company that builds it. So we start off. Uh, building kind of our SEER model, we start off with these things called stocks. So a stock can be um, any, uh, any quantity. So in our case, our first stock would be something like our uh, susceptible population. So we'll call it susceptible population. All right, and then we, uh, oh, I can't get it. Well, let's leave it there for now. You know what I mean. Um, and we can call it and put some kind of number in it. Let's say we have a population of 1,000 people that are susceptible to our particular disease. All right. Uh, the next thing we would need is an uh, infected population. So people will go from the infected population to, uh, sorry, from the susceptible population to being infected. And so I'll put another stock here. And this one's going to be a little bit different because unlike the susceptible population, which just stands still, once you become infected with disease, you usually stay in that kind of disease, um, in that mode for a little while before you move out of it and then uh, you either recover or you become susceptible again or, or you die. So in this case, we, we change it. Instead of a stock, it's going to be something slightly different. It's going to be called a conveyor. And what a conveyor does is some item goes onto that conveyor, all right? It stays on it for a certain amount of time, and then once that time runs out, it leaves. And as things come onto it, they stay in the same order. So if we have five people come in one day, then six people come in the next, that uh, five, group of five people will leave first, and the group of six people will leave. So it's basically just like um, uh, a conveyor belt. You put something on, it stays for a certain amount of time, and then it comes off. And it leaves in the same order that it comes onto it. Uh, but we still have to have a population. We say we start with an infected population of maybe um, 10 people. All right, so we're going to call this our infected population. Now, one thing we've got to consider with our infected population is how long are they going to be infected for? All right, so we have to add a new variable, and these circles are things we can either put constants or equations into, and these constant equations that we're going to govern how things flow from one stock uh, or conveyor to another. So we'll call this our um, in, uh, infection, uh, infectious period. All right. And we'll assume we're going to have an infectious period of, uh, let's say, 10 days. So in this model, we're going to run everything daily. We're going to assume everything happens from day to day. And we're going to do that so at the end we can actually uh, include some real uh, weather data into it. And so in our conveyor, we have a variable called transit time. And so again, that's the time it takes to go in from going into the conveyor to exit it. And that time is going to be equal to our, in, uh, our infectious period, which we have right here. All right. And the last thing we need is our uh, recovered um, period. So for this, um, in this case, we're going to assume that you are recovered for a little bit, and then you go back to being uh, susceptible after that. So um, it'll also be a, a uh, conveyor because, again, you go into that uh, recovered time. You stay there for some amount of time um, before you go back to being um, susceptible to the disease again. So this is going to be our recovered uh, 
um, stock. And we'll assume at the beginning of it that there's nobody uh, in it. All right. And once again, we have an infectious period. We're also going to need an uh, immune period. So we assume you recover your immune for a certain amount of time before you can become infected again. So we'll call it the immune uh, period. And we're going to assume for our, uh, for our simple model, I'm going to put it to zero for now. So I'm going to assume for this disease, uh, for our first runs, that as soon as you recover, you go back to being uh, susceptible to the disease again. So once again, we have to put a transit time. And that's going to be equal to our immune period. All right, so we have the separate stocks, and we have to actually connect them together. And so for that, we have these things called flows. So this is a flow, and this just uh, designates how things move in your system, okay? In this case, we have um, a flow that moves from being susceptible to infected, and we have one that goes from being infected to recovered, and then lastly, we have one that goes from being recovered and moving back to being, once again, susceptible to the disease. Oops, not down there. Try that one more time. There we go. All right, so for going to the infected to the recovered stage, from recovered back to the susceptible stage, we know exactly how they flow, right? You are infected for a certain amount of time, you go to be recovered, you're recovered for a certain amount of time, you go back to being susceptible. So what we need to know now is, okay, how do we go from being susceptible to infected? And it's based on a few variables that we'll put in here. And they're things you've actually seen before um, that some of the other speakers have talked about. They include things like your contact rate. So um, this could be the um, amount of contacts that each infected person has. And we'll make that um, 10. It's going to be uh, based on the infection rate. So what's the rate at um, which people get infected? And in this case, um, I'm going to make the infection rate um, 0 0.02. So we assume that uh, there's only a 2% chance. Is that the probability of infection? Contact? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. And all right. So those things um, um, are going to matter, right? So when you build these models, what makes them kind of intuitive and, and actually can be kind of a check for you is you make these little arrows right here and you connect to things that, um, that are related um, or you'll need in your equation. So if we want to know how many people go from being susceptible to being infected, which is controlled by this flow, we need to know how many contacts people have, what the, uh, what the infection rate is. We need to know how many people are infected. And we also have to know um, um, the percent of the people who are, um, who are still susceptible, which, in which case you can need these other variables as well. All right. And so therefore, our, our probability of going from susceptible, or the number of people going from susceptible to infected um, is the um, number of infected people times the number of contacts they'll have times their, um, the infection rate, the probability that they'll actually infect someone, and then we have to multiply that times the, um, the percent of people who are, um, or the percent chance that they'll actually come in contact with someone who's, all, who's uh, susceptible. So it would be susceptible times the um, infected plus recovered um, plus um, susceptible uh, population. All right, so this is a very, I think at least one person has kind of done an equation very similar to this. All right, let me see if that's. So I think that's, what we, that's all we need to actually build our initial model. So we're going to run it over the course. So when we run our model, we have to choose our specifications. We're going to run it over the course of, we're going to assume it's a daily time step. Uh, so we're going to put our change is just one. We're going to assume over each step is one day. And we're going to run over the course of one year. So we'll put 365 days. And again, I'm just doing this 
you could choose any amount of time you wanted. But we're choosing 365 days because that's one year time period. And we're going to figure out ways how to include climate data in here. And just one year is a good period to do that for. Can you ask something? Yep. So is, if I look at uh, when you say the infectious period is 10 days, mm -hmm. is this uh, how we would do it with our differential equation so it is an exponential distributed with that mean? Or do you mean that every individual has a... Every individual will stay in there for, yeah, for, for 10, so... So it, so it keeps into account the, time, the amount of time. And exactly, yeah. In the yeah, so each time someone goes in there, so each time, so if you, each day, it's going to keep track of that. Okay. So it'll be a little bit different each day depending on... Um, um, all the other variables in the equation. Okay, um, so we're gonna run it. Um, we're gonna look at a graph, so we can put some graphs here. And the two variables we'll look at are the um, susceptible people over time and the number of people who are infected over time. Oops, wrong one. All right, and so we just go, um, we can make our simulations really fast or really slow. We're going to make them really fast just so uh, we can go a little quicker here. So we run it. It runs the simulation over one year. Oops. And this is the graph we get. All right. And it's kind of what you would expect. OK, we have the, um, the laser point here. I think I might have one here. Uh, I think we can see it. So you have the susceptible population, or sorry, your infected population. You can see it starts low, and it starts off slow. And as more people become infected, uh, the infection increases until you get to a point where all of a sudden the amount of susceptible people in the population starts to get lower and lower. And so your um, odds of inf making a new infection um, decreases. And then it kind of just levels off at this, um, uh, this kind of equilibrium point, where each day the same amount of people get infected are the same amount of people um, um, uh, recovering. All right, so you've got to get this equilibrium value. And you can see in this case, uh, it comes about 505 people who are susceptible and uh, 459 uh, are infected over time. And each day, the same amount being infected are recovering. All right, so that's just a very simple model. It's not meant to be really realistic. Because what we really want to do now is say, okay, that's for just a model that assumes some constant infection rate over time. However, a lot of infections are temperature-based, things like um, I talked about in uh, my first lecture, like, um, like flu, where the ability for the virus to uh, survive in the environment depends on things like specific humidity. And specific humidity changes over time, right? You might have a wet season and a dry season. So we do that too. Uh, so um, keep in mind what this graph looks like. It's meant to be simple on purpose. So you can basically see you have this initial phase where the infection happens, and then it kind of just gets into an equilibrium value, and that stays for um, the rest of the time. And if we ran this for 10 years, it would be the same uh, thing for 10 straight years. But we want now our infection rate to also include um, a climate component to it. So we're going to add a new equation, which is climate, all right? And um, I'm just going to assume here some generic variable. So I'm saying climate, and for any particular model, climate could mean temperature, could mean precipitation, it could mean humidity, it could mean anything, all right? So this variable is going to be called climate. And I'm going to say that climate varies throughout the year. And if you look at a lot of variables like temperature, it tends to be kind of this sinusoidal wave, right? So you have you know, your coldest period in the, uh, in the winter. And then as you get to spring, it gets warm. You hit your highest point in the summer. And then it comes back down in the fall. And then it goes back to where it was before in the, uh, in the winter. So we're going to use a sinusoidal wave to represent our climate. And in, in Stella, it's just a, an equation called uh, si uh, you can use sine wave or cosine wave. I'm going to actually use a cosine wave. So I just put cosine wave, all right? And then we're going to say our infection rate was um, 0 0.02. We're going to say, OK, climate also has, um, uh, is related to that infection rate in some, in some way. So I'm going to say it has, our sine wave has an amplitude of 0 0.005. And our period is 365. So the period of this wave is, is just one full year, all right? So then our wave, so then you wouldn't ha you'd have either not one full cycle or more than one full cycle for a year. So if we made our period like, you know. No, it'll just run for the 365. So at some point your wave will get cut off. But you can just change your runtime. Let's say you want it to be 400 days. You could just change your runtime 
from 0 to 365 to 0 to 400, and then you'd get the full right. wave I pattern. Can use a variable for runtime, and then use that variable. What was that? I can use a variable for runtime, mm -hmm. and then have only one thread with a random change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's many ways you can do this. I'm just kind of showing um, one simple example. All right, so um, I'm going to say, OK, this is our, this is our climate. Um, uh, related infection component, okay? So we close this down. And so now we say that um, climate is affecting our infection rate, so we connect climate to infection rate. Instead, instead of our infection rate just being point, uh, 0 0.02, we're going to say, okay, that's our kind of baseline level, but climate also adds to it. So we add climate to this. All right, and then we're going to look at our... Um, we're going to run it again, and we're going to see our graph. And you see our graph is very different now, OK? It's not, very, it's not a simple just um, uh, movement where it's straight, right? Because during the year, certain things happen, OK? If we add, actually, climate to our graph as well, let's just see what the climate is doing. So this is our climate-dependent infection rate. You can see it levels off, but then as the climate becomes less uh, conducive for the infection, our number of infected people goes down and the number of people who are susceptible goes up, all right? But once the climate returns to a higher level, um, we, we return to the, uh, the infection rate goes back up again. And we can, we can run this for, let's say we want to run it for, um, uh, instead of one year, let's just run it for 10 years instead. All right, and here's what you see happening again. So you get, instead of this simple pattern where everyone gets infected and stays constant, you see this seasonality, all right? And this is something you see with a lot of diseases in many places. For instance, vector-borne diseases. Um, so if I, uh, I did some work in um, Puerto Rico, and you can tell that there's definitely a dry, warm season, and then it fades off in the winter. And, uh, and that continues um, throughout the years. Now here's another interesting thing we can do to it. So let's go back to just, um, um, one year, just because it's a little bit easier to analyze. All right, so we assumed that our amplitude was um, 0 0.005. But we can make it a little bit higher, too, OK? So let's, in this case, say, OK, let's say it's 0 0.01 instead. So now it has uh, a much bigger effect. All right, now your, your climate component infection is about the same amount as just your kind of baseline level infection. And as you can imagine, all right, now your graph is really, uh, is highly affected by climate, all right? There's a huge climate signal in here now. Your infection, your, uh, sorry, your infected population drops down when the climate is less conducive for the infection to occur, and it rises back up when, um, when the climate is uh, more favorable for infection. Now, interestingly enough, if you make it high enough, all right, so now let's make it just a little bit higher. We'll go from 0.01 to 0.02, so now this is um, by far the dominant um, factor in uh, how infectious this disease is. Now you see something else happen, right? And that is the uh, infection uh, is no longer in the population. So right around here, you never infected individual goes to zero, and the number of susceptible people goes all the way up to 1,010, which is our, our max population. All right, now this is an important um, phenomenon because it's, it's completely realistic. Can, I mean, can you think of a disease where this occurs? There's plenty of vector-borne diseases where this occurs, all right? Most places, well, I don't say most places, but a lot of places have seasonal vector-borne diseases in the sense that it not only is it high, does it have a high and low season, it has a high and it has an absolute zero season. And this is the case of something like dengue fever in, in Florida, okay? In the United States, they get dengue in Florida um, almost every year for the last four or five years as a small outbreak. But it only lasts for that's those summer months. What happens is, once it gets to be September, October, the temperatures there, even in southern Florida, are not high enough, okay, for the mosquito to be able to complete its life cycle and, at the same time, the virus to be able to replicate at high enough quantities in the mosquito so that it can eventually become infectious. And this is important because during those times of the year that aren't the summer months, it's impossible all right, climate makes it impossible for dengue to be uh, transmitted there. So in order for that disease to survive there, it means every year it has to be reintroduced, either from um, most of the time from people coming in from a country that are infected with the disease 
or in rare cases, it could be mosquitoes uh, brought through, it could be um, any kind of shipping or, or cargo, maybe on airplanes into that country. So this is very common. It's a very important thing to think about um, is when is climate conducive for the disease, all right? And it's also important if you look uh, across the United States, so Florida has a good probably four or five months where the disease could be transmitted. Um, if you went up further into the United States, there'd probably be two or three months where it could be transmitted, and further up, one month being transmitted. So your risk varies uh, seasonally, all right? And it also just risk, it, there's a risk that um, changes overall just by the amount of time during the year where a virus uh, can be transmitted. Because if it's a longer period of time, all right, you have a higher probability that somebody eventually is going to come into that area who can, um, who can start a small epidemic, all right, or a group of people. And in the case of Florida, this happened where there was a group of students with dengue um, made a trip to uh, Hawaii for, I think it was, a, it was a large band concert, and they had a small outbreak there. All right, Hawaii obviously has um, a warmer climate where they can sustain a dengue uh, outbreak for a longer period of time. Now, if that happened, let's say, in New York City, there might be a, you know, a month in the, uh, during the year in New York where you could get sustained uh, uh, dengue outbreaks. So it doesn't matter how many people with a dengue infection go to New York, unless they happen to come during that specific month, and during that specific month they happen to be bitten by the right mosquito and happen to bite somebody else, during that one month you can't have an outbreak. So your risk varies quite a bit seasonally, all right? And also, just over the course of an entire year, your risk of there being an outbreak varies by the amount of time that climate in your area is able to sustain that particular disease. Now, when I talked yesterday, uh, we're going to put this back to um, the lower level of 0 0.05, I talked about the difference between um, weather and climate, all right? So climate is kind of our long-term average. So the sinusoidal wave, it's nice, but that's not actually what, um, what it looks like, all right? Weather has some random things in it. We get cooler days in the summer. We sometimes get a warm period in the winter. So we're going to try to add weather to our model. And by, uh, by doing that, we're going to get, again, more slightly uh, complicated um, disease transmission ecologies. So this new one is called weather. Weather is going to be more random, all right? We have kind of random cold fronts and warm fronts going through that add slightly warmer, slightly temp or cooler temperatures. All right, so in this case, we're going to call our weather variable. It's going to be um, random. So it's going to give us a random number, and, our magnet and we're going to have a magnitude for it. So we're going to have random in between negative magnitude and positive magnitude. It's going to yell at me in a second and say uh, we don't have magnitude defined yet. So we have to make another variable called magnitude. And this is, magnitude is basically going to be the variability in our weather, all right? We can have a very small um, variability, and this could be a location where it's sunny almost all the time. Maybe there's a couple degrees difference. Or it could be some areas where there could be large uh, jumps in the, um, in the temperature from day to day. So magnitude is essentially the, um, the variability in our, our weather, all right? And we're going to use uh, a starting magnitude of um, also 0 0.005. So we're going to connect magnitude, all right, because our weather depends on our magnitude variable. All right, and then our weather is also important for the infection rate. So you could do this two different ways. I'm, I'm going to add them all together, but you could also add weather to climate and then make climate your your one connection. Um, so the infection rate is all is now the base infection rate plus the uh, effects of climate, and now plus the effects of weather, as well. All right, and we'll run it through the model. All right, now we get a slightly different result. Okay, so we still see the same general curve, right? But we have lots of kind of little spikes and little dips that go on uh, throughout the season as well. And you see this all the time, especially with um, uh, things like vector-borne diseases, where you might get a patch of rain, which increases your mosquito population, and therefore you get um, uh, more, uh, more infections. Or you might have a slight dry spell where the mosquito population dips a little bit, OK? Especially because mosquitoes and vectors, they're very sensitive to, um, to climate variables, especially um, precipitation, especially if, that's their, um, if they need it for reproduction, like mosquitoes do. Now, we can increase. We're going to do a couple of things. We're just like the, um, um, the weather, we're going to increase the magnitude of our variability. So that was you know, fairly small. Now we're going to increase it up to um, 0 0.01. 
Oops. Run it again. All right, and you see it's a similar graph, but the spikes are much bigger, okay? I'm going to do it one more time. All right, we'll do 0.02 this time. So once again, the spikes get even bigger. But what's important to note is now you're starting to lose that climate signal, all right? Your weather is becoming more dominant than the changes in climate. And this is going to depend from place to place. If you're someplace uh, near the equator, maybe, where you have the same temperature all year, all right, or the same average temperature all year, you might not see your, your conditions for um, being able to transmit a virus don't change over the course of the year. However, from week to week, from day to day, these could change quite a bit because of um, especially precipitation or humidity or things of that nature. All right. So that's an important uh, uh, point to look at. You have to look at not just climate, um, but you can also look at weather too, weather being a little bit more random. Can you ask another thing? Yep. Uh, here you have uh, a random num a different random mm -hmm. number every day. Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Could I put also some correlation? In the, in the, could I put some correlation oh, yeah. in the noise? Yeah. The yeah, you could. You could say, um, um, let's say um, you're in a place where when it tends to rain, it tends to rain in spurts of like three or four days in a row. So if it was rain, you might say, okay, if it rained today, there's maybe a 70% chance of it raining tomorrow too. You, know, you could do all kinds of things to make it more complicated, to make the climate uh, more similar to the place you're trying to model. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to do... Uh, one more thing that I'm going to use, a little bit of real data. So this one's a little more complicated. We have weather and we have climate, all right? We're going to add one more thing that can uh, vastly affect um, infections that are just related to, um, uh, to both weather and climate, and that's disasters, all right? So oftentimes you have sometimes a disaster occurs, and this could be um, a bunch of flooding where all of a sudden that flooding causes huge amounts of breeding grounds for a vector, okay? Or it, it could be just that the amount of... Um, disaster that occurs decreases the capacity for the public um, health workers to deal with the infection, okay? Instead of people doing vector control, they have to focus on something else, um, like cleaning up, saving lives, that sort of thing. All right, so you can implement this many, many ways uh, into models and everything. Of course, Pi uh, sorry, Stella is it's a very kind of high level, um, easy to use program, but you could easily put this in Stella, or I'm sure R could do, oh sorry, you could do it in Python, which is what I try to do it in, um, but if you want to do it in R, I'm sure there's ways to do it in R, I'm not that familiar with it. Um, or you could just use any other generic programming language if you like to use C or um, Java or whatever you need to. Um, but I'm going to say we have a disaster status. Oops. So I'll keep it like that, disaster. All right, we're going to say it starts off at zero, okay? We're going to have a binary. It's either a disaster status or it's not a disaster status. And we're going to make it a, um, also a conveyor because we're going to assume that um, the disaster status changes to either one or zero. It stays there for a certain amount of time. It takes time for the disaster to occur, things to clean up and get back to normal. All right, so we're going to make it a conveyor. And we're going to have a variable to um, say, okay, how long is our disaster? And we're going to assume it's, you know, th maybe three weeks, so 21 days. So there's disaster length. All right. And after 21 days, it'll, um, it'll flow out. All right, and so for disaster occur, we're going to use another kind of random variable. We're going to use a Poisson distribution here. But I'm going to also make the assumption that when a disaster occurs, another disaster is not going to occur. All right, so you can only have you know, one disaster going on at a time. And this may or may not be true. It could happen that you have another disaster that exasperates the problem, or maybe you have another disaster, but it keeps things the same. All right, 
So we're going to see, we're going to do a little program. Oh, sorry, very easy little programming, one line. It's going to say if disaster status is greater than zero, then we're going to keep it zero. There's no way another disaster could occur. Else, we're going to use a Poisson distribution. Poisson. And we need to have our value of mu, so we'll put mu in there. And we need to make another um, converter for mu. All right. In our case, we're going to assume mu is 0.1. So basically, on average, a disaster occurs over every uh, 100 days or so. But you can make it whatever you want. You can assume that you know, disasters happen every 10 years, um, or however else you want to do it. All right, and now, so disaster is also going to be affecting our um, infection rate. All right, so now we have plus. Now, our disaster status is definitely going to be 1 or 0. So we'll just say um, where it's going to be disaster status times, um, and in this case, we're going to say um, 0.02. So if there's a disaster, we're going to add 0.02 to our infectious rate. If we're not, it's not going to add anything to it. All right, so we run the model. Oops. And, and here we go. And so now you can kind of see these, these kind of time periods where you get these kind of unexpected spikes like right here, especially during times of the year when you wouldn't expect there to be um, any kind of disease occurring. All right. Now one thing to notice too is these spikes tend to be bigger um, during times when you already have um, high prevalence of a disease. And this is an important thing to note too. If you're already in the middle of an epidemic and something occurs where um, you, the public health agency isn't able to do as much as they normally would, you're going to really exasperate that spike. On the other hand, if it occurs during a um, lower time of the year, maybe a disaster has the, has the um, chance to, um, uh, to create an epidemic when you normally wouldn't expect an epidemic. And this could be an area that's you know, generally dry, and so maybe during the dry season, there's not a lot of malaria or dengue fever or something. But you know, a random hurricane occurs or hits you, or a random storm comes through, dumps a bunch of, water, bunch of water, all of a sudden you have a lot more mosquitoes, and all of a sudden you get a small epidemic when, when you wouldn't expect one. All right, so uh, disasters are an important thing you can put into your model. Um, you can increase the probability uh, of them. So there we only had a few of them. If we made our mu um, 0.03, all right, now they're going to occur uh, more often. All right, so now you do see a bunch of, uh, kind of probably one here, here, here. Those big spikes occur because we're generally, uh, we're almost probably doubling um, our infection rate due to those disasters. OK, so what I've shown you so far are kind of, we're throwing things in the model kind of theoretically. We're saying, OK, here's what could happen mm -hmm. randomly, general sine wave and everything. But um, on particular types of models, including on this one, we could add real data to it, OK? So we're going to clean things up a little bit, and we're going to get rid of all these um, kind of these statistically um, generated um, weather and climate variables. So we say, OK, no disasters. We don't need weather because we're going to put real data in instead. Uh, all right. so. In this case, we're going to use temperature. I'm going to say, OK, temperature is directly related to um, the infection rate. OK, so this is our temperature. And instead of making it a constant, we're actually going to make it what's called a um, graphical function. And here, we can put real points in. for So for every time step, we can put in a different temperature. All right? And I actually grabbed some data from the, um, this is from weatherunderground.com. Uh, and this is for the um, weather station at the Cape Town Airport. All right, and you can see that we have lots and lots of uh, variables in here. Um, they have max temperature, mean, minimum temperature, dew point, uh, humidity. Uh, this is just some of you go across. Uh, min humidity, max humidity, sea level pressure, all the way to uh, visibility, uh, cloud cover, um, wind direction at that very, um, the very far end, wind degrees, generally where's the wind coming from. But we're going to assume it's basically mean temperature that's our most important um, factor. And I think I took it out. So I'm doing this from 2014 all the way through to 2015, so two years of data. Two. 
actually have to change one thing. So we're going to instead run this. We're going to run it for two years. So uh, to 730. All right. So this data is freely available. It's easy to get. Um, so we take our data, put it into our model here. All right. And so for each time step, we get a temperature associated with it. What was that? The time steps went to point 0.5. They went to point 0.5. Oh, that's because um, 731. Yeah, that's weird. Why they? Let me try one more time. So 0, 738 dt is 1. Let's try creating it again. I might have got stuck on the fact that when I created it, there was only 365. So temp. Yeah, should have seven thirty. Hopefully this works now. Okay, there we go. I think it's because I created it, we only had three hundred and sixty five, so it just uh, cut everything in half. All right, so now for every time step, we have a, um, a temperature. Yeah. All right, and we're going to assume um, I looked up the um, min and max temperature. So oftentimes, you can actually find a pretty good relationship between, uh, or I shouldn't say oftentimes, sometimes you can find a pretty good relationship with your infection rate and, um, and the temperature. Um, I just assumed there was a linear one in that um, the minimum temperature for this time period is 7 degrees. The max is 29. And I just drew a linear regression to it. Okay, So this is purely um, for the sake of doing this. But you know, maybe you have good numbers for it. Things like um, dengue, we have pretty good numbers. We know how long um, the um, infection period is based on temperature. So for our sake, it's 0 .009, oh, sorry, 309 times temperature plus 0 0.0036. So that's what we're going to make our infection rate. Our infection rate is going to be completely based on temperature this temperature relationship. 0 0.009. Oops. Oh, that's fine. No, that's not fine. Times temperature plus 0 0.0036. All right, and there you see what we get. All right, and you can see um, in this case uh, the um, um, both the climate signal, right? Can you see those kind of broad humps, which are the climate signal, and inside that you see the jag uh, lines, which is the um, the temperature signal. And you can see that this isn't quite as random. So you saw the kind of spikes, where it's a little more it's a little more squiggly with the um, when we use our theoretical um, um, weather because there is some correlation, right? If it's 22 degrees today, it's probably going to be around 23 or 24 tomorrow. It's usually not going to jump to 28, 29, or, or much lower than that. All right. So now we have, um, we can make predictions based purely on um, the data we have. So instead of making a theoretical kind of um, idea of, OK, what does the infection look like over a year, we can actually use real data. All right? And if we had, let's say, um, let's say this is malaria, and we had malaria cases, we could run our model. All right, and then compare it to the malaria cases and see how good a job we do at simulating it. And for some things, some of these models do a really good job. We did it for um, Puerto Rico with a kind of similar model uh, that included all the entomology and the, um, and the epidemiology in it. And in some cases, we were able to get R squared values up of like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, which is very good. Because if you can do that, then you can start to make forecasts as well. So one way to be doing that is, all right, I had that, that data right there, which is for one full year. Now, Weather Underground also has a forecast up to 10 days out of um, 
sorry, temperature and precipitation data as well. So I could easily run the model for 10 more days, add that um, temperature, data, or sorry, that weather data to it, okay, run it again, and we'd be running the model 10 days into the future. We can then use that future model output to determine what um, malaria cases are going to be like in the next 7 to 10 days. You could also add seasonal forecasts too. Um, but you've got to remember that our seasonal forecasts aren't going to be quite as accurate. So you can put daily seasonal forecasts in there, but you really want to kind of um, scale your, your results to, to a higher level. All right? So if you're doing a weekly forecast, you probably don't want to rely on the numbers for each day. You might add them all up to the week and say, okay, next week I think there's going to be about this many cases. That's a more kind of accurate prediction rather than saying, you know, two days out there's going to be this many cases, three days out there's going to be this many cases because there's so much randomness around it. For a seasonal forecast, let's say you did a three-month seasonal forecast, you probably might want to uh, scale your numbers to the monthly level. So you could say, okay, one month out, I think there's going to be this many cases, two months out, this many, and so forth. And then, of course, the last thing you can do is you could put actual climate change data in the model as well. All right, so you could run it 10 years. Let's say we grabbed the climate data from, um, from Cape Town for the last 10 years. All right, and then we said, all right, in the future, it's projected that Cape Town temperatures are increased by 2 degrees Celsius. In fact, we can add that to the model right now if we wanted. So let's say we add a climate change component to it. All right. Ooh, actually, it's easier to do it this way. All right, and let's say we start off with zero. We're going to do a sensitivity analysis to make it go a little bit quicker. All right, so now it's not just times temperature. It's times temperature plus our whatever our climate change, whatever we think it's going to be. And we're going to do a different type of graph. Here's our... Um, We're going to do several runs, but we're going to keep them all on the same graph so that we can compare what they, um, what they show. All right. And we're going to do a sensitivity analysis. So this is a different type of run. So we're going to, we're going to do a sensitivity analysis compared to climate change. Oops. Oh, what is one? I just grab that one. There we go. So let's do three runs. I'm going to say, okay, we start with there's zero climate change. We're going to do the normal conditions. I'm going to say it goes up to four, um, four degrees. So we're going to do three runs. One at adding zero degrees to it. One adding two degrees. One adding four degrees. All right, we'll do our run. It's going to run the model three times. And our graph is going to show the results of those three runs. All right, and as you can imagine, our regression in this case, we showed that as temperature increased, infections increased. So if you increase the temperature, right, our first run is the blue run. If you add uh, increased temperature in run two and three, we increase the number of infected individuals. Okay? So this graph is just infected individuals um, over time. Now this is very simple. We just assume that every day we added you know, two degrees to our, our model. But if you look at um, climate models, you can be more specific. You can say, okay, maybe in January we had one degree, maybe February we had two degrees, depending on how things occur. And we just did temperature. You might also want to add precipitation or humidity to your model as well. So this is just uh, kind of an introduction on specific ways you could add climate and weather data to your models um, in both the theoretical sense, just by adding maybe kind of a general like a sine curve and maybe some random weather to it, but also if you wanted to make something more predictive, we could actually use real values in it instead. So uh, I think that's it. And I'll take any questions if you have any. What happens if you... <coughs> oh, let's talk. <laughs> what happens if you run this simulation with a 10 degree increase instead of Oh, you really could. Huge increase. Yeah, so we can we can try that. We can. So let's make our climate change ten. Yeah. Because we're supposed to be seeing cases come down for. No, because uh, the well, this is. It doesn't yeah. have any effect of decrease. Yeah. So we assumed a. Um, His relation is very simple. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, you can but run it. Have oh, okay. Right. Things like that. And you can see that our infected, our average infected population now is a lot higher than it was, you know, before I think it was like four, six, now it's almost yeah, six, four the other way. Yeah. 
But you could, and, and in fact, most models that we do are, you might have, instead of just a linear, yeah. you might, it might be exponential so that, you know, the, um, during the summer months, it's, it's more affected by the, than the winter months, or, you know, maybe vice versa, or it could be, you know, palabra. Like, so when I looked at, um, so when I saw flu, flu has high infection rates at both high humidity, so, yeah, high specific humidity and very low specific humidity. But then at the, um, at kind of that middle range, it's very low. So, you know, by uh, increasing the humidity, you might change, so one location might show an increase in flu cases, another might show a decrease in flu cases, or might see a shift in when the flu cases occur. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not, I don't with, you mean uh, like in your, in your graph including kind of those distributions inside of it, yeah, so when it comes like, out? I, I think, um, uh, you know, often you'll rerun your simulation yeah. different values and then you'll mm -hmm. have many simulations, but I just wondered if you could do that, is there some way that you could do it where it would just map out the confidence intervals? No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do it itself. You'd have to run it and kind of map them out yourself. You could, you could set it to, and this is what I usually do if I'm doing a lot of runs, so that it'll do like the 10,000 runs. And it, you can actually, so we did it as a, um, as a graph, but you can, um, you know, we can do a table too. So if we put like infected, I know, I have to run it one more time. Yeah, yeah. And usually, I mean, I don't do, so what Stella's not very good at is making graphics. And you will almost never use a graphic right from Stella. You usually take the data out and put it in, you know, whatever you want to do, MATLAB, Excel, R, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can also uh, consider delays or lag in Yeah. In the so there's actually, um, I just showed you a very few of the functions, but you also have, um, so, um, We have delays, too, and different forms of delay. So things that you put them in, and it'll delay its effect, too. And you, you can set it what you want. If you want to delay three, it'll delay three time intervals or two time intervals and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of different, they call these bulletins, where they're just functions that are actually built into the model that you can use to make things a little bit more complicated. You can actually put arrays into the model, too. So instead you want to do like 10 populations at a time, you can make a set of 10 arrays on top of each other. And so it'll be running all 10 at the same time. I actually use it to make things a little bit more um, complicated, so I, um, so for mosquito models, um, again, it's a little bit easier to do in Python than it is in Stella, but you can say, okay, my population is going to stay here, and it's going to stay in this level, let's say it's a larval state. You know, each day I'm going to calculate what the temperature is, and so I can determine how much the larval grew. If it grows to, you know, a period beyond one, we say it completed its growth rate, it's going to move on to the pupil stage. If not, it's just going to go to another level of the array in the larval stage. And you just, it keeps cycling there until its development value equals one, and then it can shoot off into the, the, the next level. So you can make very kind of complicated entomological models that are very specific to the particular climate or particular weather variables that you have. You know, if you equations, have, does that show you the differential equations to solve it? No, it's using Euler's method to kind of so you can so you can have that. It's it's a numerical method. Right. So yeah. from the model, they create a system of differential equations which it solves. Is that how the simulations run, or is it agent based? So it 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 doesn't solve them. It runs them for um for one time step in the future, and then it looks and s yeah. So then then it'll say okay, I went. I think it went up this much. Um, I look at what the derivative is. Add that times my dt, and then add that to the next value to, to make it go higher. And you can choose, you can um, use Euler's method, and you can use Runcata. There's actually two methods for Runcata. You can use one and two for it. Mm -hmm. and you it can't see the actual equations that it's solving. No, no, no. That's the unfortunate part. You can, you can see all, so we're in model mode. You can still go in equation mode, and it'll show us all the equations inputs we put into the model. Uh, okay. and, and this is all of them. But you can see like infected t equals infected t minus dt times flow and so forth. So it shows you th that part of it. Um, I'll just leave that up there. Um, I'm aware of other software that does similar things like simulating yes. MATLAB mm -hmm. and Xcos for Octave. That actually is free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so have you got any comments on how they compare? I, I'm not sure. I've only, I've, 
see, I'm doing kind of most things in Python. What I do like, so these are nice, they're easy to kind of put together, but you're still kind of limited to, to the, the bullet, like the functions and everything that are in the model. Um, so I haven't actually used some of them, but I'd assume they're probably very similar. I wouldn't imagine that, um, that this would be much better than, um, um, well, Simulink isn't free, right? It comes with MATLAB, which is incredibly expensive. Yeah, I, would, I think it would probably be, I'd say almost just as good. I, just, I'm, I don't know for sure, but I'd assume that there, there's probably not too much difference in them. And I think a lot of them are starting to go towards a, um, a similar um, format so that sometimes you can open models in different, in, in different programs. I'm not sure. I don't think they're that far where you can open any of them. It's not like a Word document that there's many different things you can open like a text document in. But um, I think they are, systems programming is starting to try to move to a common format. Mm -hmm. But I'd recommend if you're interested in this, trying those free programs out, definitely. Mm -hmm. how, how easy is it to incorporate uh, control strategies, like you're vaccinating people or quarantining people? Yeah, so it's kind of, it's, in some ways it's limited by your imagination. So we could, um, so we kind of threw that disaster thing in there, but we could kind of throw like a, you know, if we wanted to do like a control, yeah, so, you know, and, um, and you can do it, make it kind of theoretical, like it's proportional to something. Or you could actually, um, you know, we had, so we had that graphical function where every day we had a different time in it. You could put a graphical function and say, like, okay, on this day we vaccinated people, so we assume they're vaccinated for this amount of time. You know, and then another day we would look at we vaccinated them again. So um, it's, and it's a good way that you can, you can do that and you can just keep running it over and over again. You can do maybe, like, you know, 100 runs and see which ones work best and so forth. Okay, thank you very much.